Excellent. Thank you. I'll start it off. Thank you, everybody, for coming today uh, on an early Friday morning for the first Rise and Grind. And, and as you know, this has been a needed tradition, and we're going to continue this. There'll be one in October, November, and possibly one in December. And Yao Ling will get that information out as we develop that schedule further. And forgive me if I'm, I'm on my little laptop screen because I decided to work from home today. And so I don't have another screen, so I'm just kind of moving everybody around. But um, let me just uh, talk real quick about the topic. This is something that uh, Angie Dunn and I have talked about, have been working on for over a year now. And we presented some of this at, at ICREE this summer, and we're kind of taking this and we built on it a little bit for this presentation and hoping to continue our work on this uh, through a research project uh, in the next academic year. But Donna has, is very involved in this at her university and Angie and I both at Widener, or actually Angie more so than me, are very involved in this through various, and Angie will talk about some of the boards <coughs> and things that we're doing at Widener to help in this area. So, all right, so basically, welcome back everybody to New Ac Academic Year and what we're calling the September Surge. Um, because we had this problem, obviously, last year, as all of us came back in person on campus and students were transitioning from being online in most cases or some form of hybrid learning. And now, you know, we're all fully back, of course, um, and still dealing with student mental health concerns. It hasn't gone away and it's not going to go away anytime soon. And we called it the September search because I know personally, and I'm sure Donna and Angie also, and many of you have had to deal with Already, I've had to deal with two different situations with students um, that were struggling in class, and it was due to mental health concerns. And so we've talked, uh, when we met before this presentation, as we were talking about really just the lack of engagement and initiative and students are really still kind of struggling to connect um, in class, out of class. And so it's something that we're kind of all grappling with, and I'm sure you all can relate to that. And I know for us at Widener, and I'm sure Don at Stockton, there's been up, an uptick in academic assistance and accommodations mm -hmm. requested by students. It's been a kind of a difficult situation or kind of uncharted territory or, or waters to navigate. You know, do you let a student zoom in um, just for one class, et cetera, et cetera. So we're having those kinds of conversations at our university about, you know, do we, uh, when can you give someone accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something else that's kind of been coming up even more so at the start of this academic year. Don and Angie, do you want to add anything to that or kind of just add on to that? Just uh, quickly, if you don't mind, first, thank sure. you all for being here. And uh, I, although I feel like we're preaching a little to the choir because anybody who joins this session it, um, is probably in our camp, right? Super student-centered faculty that, probably care, you know, I don't want to say more than, than other people, that's not fair, but I mean, to a, to a point where it just kind of hurts our heart when we see these kids going through what they're going through, because it's real. Um, we also want to make a note that we are not mental health professionals at all. We completely have come together to do this over the last year from the lens of being on the front lines is basically what we say. We see students for, you know, big swaths of time. My blocks are two and a half hours twice a week. So, you know, when you're spending that kind of time on task with students, it is not difficult to see behavior um, that that is concerning, right? And, and so that that's evidenced in the classroom, but it is also very much evidenced uh, by their behavior when they're not in the classroom. So we're, that's just a springboard to lay some foundation. The, everything we're sharing with you today is obviously accessible. And, um, and what we're hoping to do is start a dialogue and then maybe move forward with some sort of research that helps us, faculty, helps us in the classroom environment deal with these issues. So it's, it's, it is a hyper-focused subject matter. And Angie, what else? What else? So thank you. So thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm Angie Corbo, and I always feel so welcome when I join Nina and all of your hospitality organizations. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I would echo what uh, both Jeff and Donna said already. I think we're seeing a lot of different behaviors and concerns on our campuses. Just yesterday, a young woman who pretty much disappeared in March from her academic courses, to my surprise, came back for the fall semester, um, and the same patterns were repeating, and she was very 
very tearful yesterday as she made the difficult decision that it was time to withdraw from the university and focus on other things. Um, I hope that means for her she'll be going home back to the D.C. area where she's with family and uh, she'll be able to get the resources that she needs. She's bright, she's talented, but there was, I, I would label it, although I'm not a clinician, um, there were a lot of mental health and I think social identity issues that were interfering with her ability to succeed. So I think these issues are so important, um, even if that means it might be necessary for students to take a semester or additional time off before they can really focus on their academic goals. Yeah, and, and again, the reason why we're so passionate about this is that, as Donna said, we are not mental health professionals, but we're faculty who are having to deal with this. And we're trying to give some recommendations, tools, because we can't avoid it. And it's it's very difficult to say, well, this is really my concern. My, my domain is academics, and I'll just refer the student to the counseling center. Well, the counseling centers are overwhelmed with with many students so we have to kind of partner this whole thing so that's the point of our presentation just a couple examples of things we're doing at widener real quick then we can get in the meat of the presentation is we have what's called an early alert system at week five we just finished that we're now actually today is the last day of week six so we're pretty far deep into the semester where we have to put in concerns academic concerns for students for at least freshmen and sophomores it can be for any student and a lot of the ones that i put in so far um, some of them are due to students who are struggling men with mental health issues. And not all, but a good number of them are. Angie, you want to talk about the care team and some of the things that we're doing? Absolutely. So Jeff and I really were at a, a smaller midsize, if that's the right description, um, at Widener. So we still have that close-knit um, relationship where we're working with folks across the board, so across disciplines. And we're also really working with our campus support team. So the care team is a team of faculty, um, staff, including the counseling center, of course, campus safety, student affairs, individuals, our accessibility services uh, person, and people who are in student success and retention. So there's a nice group of professionals who are hearing concerns that are submitted. And those concerns come from faculty. They would come from resident advisors. They may come from coaches. They could actually come from other students. Our website has report it at the bottom, and that's where you can report any type of behavioral or mental health concern that you have. This team meets weekly and they make sure that they're doing the appropriate interventions. I had the opportunity, I am not on the care team, but I am on the next resource that I'll talk about. And I was talking to a member of the care team last Friday afternoon, and he's the judicial affairs officer. So typically he would see what you would expect in the first few weeks of school where people are um, enjoying their independence and maybe celebrating a little bit too much, but he said it's all really mental health and accommodations. He's like, there's a few of those alcohol violations, but he said they're overwhelmed and it's primarily mental health and accommodations. People coming in, um, they got used to the virtual learning and they have high anxiety about being in larger groups. So they're asking faculty to Zoom or record classes and that's, uh, prompting an entirely different conversation at the university of intellectual property, accessibility, and um, on the opposite side, people are concerned if they're talking in a recorded session that their voice then will become out there for anyone who's listening. So all kinds of issues that are associated with this new accommodation world that we live in. So that goes under the care team. Um, we're very fortunate because there's so many people who are champions of mental health for students on campus. And I'm also proud to say that our human resources director is involved in this. So we're also looking at mental health well-being for our employees on campus. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Our primary focus for the presentation is students, but the mental health task force is led by the provost, the associate provost who has uh, her doctorate in psychology, a PsyD, is the primary person who runs it. We have our counseling center, student affairs folks, um, two faculty representatives, a graduate school representative, and we wow. really are trying to keep track of the mental health concerns as they unfold on campus. In this mental health task force, um, we received the wonderful news last spring that we received a grant from the Jed Foundation. Jeff is going to talk about that in our next slide or two, but I'll summarize the Jed Foundation by um, a foundation that was started by a family who wanted to honor the memory 
of someone whose life was ended far too soon. And now there's resources available so educators and other community groups can support mental health initiatives. So our counseling center and Widener University received a grant uh, late spring. They did a lot of work for it over the summer. The Jed Foundation has sponsored educational training. So Widener faculty and staff who are part of the mental health task force have been privy to that. And as a result, we'll have more resources to offer our students in the upcoming academic year. So that's an exciting, um, announcement that we have we you as your institutions may have the therapy assistance online that provided an option because we know our counseling centers are overwhelmed and there's a waiting list and no one wants to have that waiting list we want people who need to be seen right away to at least have the option to see someone online before they can be seen in person and then there's a mental health first aid training program uh, and we're very fortunate to have a doctoral student in social work certified in this training. And our Department of Athletics and the Mental Health Task Force are really actively looking in to see who are the key populations, <coughs> bless you, who bless are the you, key man. populations on campus that need to participate in this. And this is really the, the train the trainer and to go off of what Donna said, we are not therapists, but we often are the frontline folks who are helping to make that referral. And this mental health first aid would enable us to have all the tools available to non-clinicians to help our students get to the next level. Great, thanks Angie. And one thing I wanna add real quick is we also, Angie co-chairs what we call the Wide University Breathe Board that was actually started out of a senior project in a capstone course that Angie taught in communication studies. And it's now evolved into this huge board with student representation at the graduate level, undergraduate level, and faculty for across every school and college. I'm very um, happy to be a part of that for my school. And we meet regularly, and it's been a great kind of uh, way to connect with students and add resources and kind of funnel up to the mental health task force and senior leadership. And that will continue this year as well. So that's another thing that we're doing at Widener. Just some quick, and I'm not going to read this because you all can read, and it's a lot of, I know it's a lot of information, probably violated our PowerPoint rules here, but <laughs> basically it's just, it's such a great, it's such great information. And we have access to any of this um, and all of this. So we just wanted to kind of set the tone of, you know, how serious this is. And I know that you know all this. And again, this um, came from the Jed Foundation. This, this, you know, mental health challenges among college students have risen significantly in recent years. And it's kind of becoming a top priority for all of us. And I'm just going to kind of quote some of the highlighted text here. This is from Healthy Minds um, study in 2021. Basically, more than 80% of students reported that emotional or mental health difficulties hurt their academic performance. And so, you know, that's obviously a large number, more than, you know, three quarters. 41% of college students were screened positive for major to moderate depression. Again, that's a significant amount and a staggering, um, you know, basically a stat. Over a quarter of faculty respondents believe that institutions do a poor job of reaching out to students of color. This is from the Mary Christie Foundation has done a lot of work in this area. And again, I know this is something that we're focusing on a wider and I'm sure Stockton is, is as well, because there's a lot of disproportionate um, concerns and services. So this is something that we're looking at as well. And again, a strong majority, 87% believe that student mental health has worsened or significantly worsened during the pandemic. And it's really kind of carrying through, as Donna pointed out, as students were kind of used to some of the, I hate these word luxuries, but you know, what became norm in the online environment that is not the case anymore, you know, in the current back to being, you know, in person, et cetera. And this is a global crisis, and I'll tell you why. I did an accreditation consultation visit for ACFA this summer at a school in Turkey in June, and I didn't even prompt this discussion. This came up in conversation, and they're like, oh my God, this is, we're all dealing with this. This is just not a US phenomenon. This is everywhere across the world. I just wanted to kind of point that out as well. We're on the front lines because we see the students the most, right? That's who we're the first point of contact. And so in the past 12 months, nearly 80% of higher ed education faculty reported they dealt with various student mental health issues. I'm sure everyone on this call has done that in some way, shape or form. And so 
Again, of the faculty surveyed, 73% stated they would appreciate professional development in this area. We're not trained therapists. We want to help. And I know, as Donna said, all of you on this call, you're on this because we're speaking to the choir. We know that you want to help students, but we're not trained. And so the more that we can help faculty have, you know, have these conversations, understand the spots and signs, et cetera, and to get students to the right place is important. And, and faculty are asking for that. Also, 20%, 21% of faculty agree that supporting students in mental and emotional distress has taken a toll on their own mental health. Look, we're all taxed, right? And a lot of the focus has been on, that's kind of a, a part two presentation on just student uh, mental health and not faculty. And so it's important that, and we have some, some comments about that towards the end of presentation as well. And this Healthy Mind study also found that 35% of students nationally say they would first talk to a faculty member. In essence, we're, we're the first point of contact to see a student struggling, right? They're not coming to class on time. They're missing assignments. They're kind of checked out in class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so also the Jed Foundation uh, found that while the primary role of faculty is to share knowledge and expertise with students, faculty are often, again, who they turn to when they're struggling. And so a lot of us, including myself, <clears throat> feel very sometimes overwhelmed you know, not wanting to overstep my bounds, but at the same time wanting to help a student, it's that kind of walking that, that fine line. And so basically, and the other thing, as we talked earlier, mental health professionals are also exhausted and burned out. And, you know, I had a situation last spring where I had a student who was not, I wouldn't say crisis, but was having some issues. And I said, the first thing is, have you, we call it CAPS, uh, our CAPS Center, right? And basically, I said, have you gone the CAPS? And he said, I did, and they have a two-week waiting list. And so, you know, that's, that's a challenge. And not uncommon. And not uncommon. And I see everybody's head shaking. So, I, I, you know, I, I, we are preaching the choir. You're all, in, you know this. Um, and I'll just segue into, you probably know all this too, but it's worth talking about because we are inching closer. If, you, if we did this presentation at Cree this summer, we are inching closer to the realization that we faculty need um, support and training. And so some of it's self-induced, you know, we'll talk about that. And also feel free to, um, we have a and a at the end, but if there's something that triggers, feel free. We're a small enough group to just um, chime in if you'd like. I have no problem with that. So this... Um, there's no doubt, you know, when we, when we teach as teachers that we teach in a holistic environment, right? So it's not just content laden, right? We, 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 I think most of us teach again from a student centered place. So, you know, do you think accommodations made during the pandemic um, need to become the norm? And I call it putting the toothpaste back in the tube. So, so do we, you know, we, we pivoted and we did it and now we kind of have to undo it. And it's it's been really difficult. Linda, I see you shaking your head. Like, so not the norm, right? These standards were loosened. I say the bar was lowered. Uh, we made lots of exceptions for quality and quantity of work. And um, it's really hard to go back on that. And so that's created a, a challenge for us, right? Um, they have, there's been lots of data on a widespread, a widespread breakdown on learning, especially on the K through 12 level, but let's face it, they come to us when they're done K through 12. And so now there's these learning gaps, which are a little bit painful. Quite frankly, not all course content um, translates well to an online format. And many of us in hospitality, you know, we do things that are experiential and we do things, you know, I don't need to talk to you about culinary. And I know the strides that our, our colleagues made doing labs online and being creative with, um, heck, I did a wine tasting, you know, online. Um, you know, there's we did modify, uh, but but is it the is it the best way to do it? And um, and now you have students who kind of lean back on, well, I we did it the other way. Why you haven't? Said, and and that's the pushback I get when they want a Zoom link um, when I'm in class, and you know I'm I'm not we're not doing that yet. We still thank God at Stockton have faculty prerogative to we do not have to do that but we can talk about that at the end um self-reported students said more than half of them said that they had learned less in the academic year on the pandemic than they had in the past so time on task and just again those bars being lowered and then um and then we saw rapid uh course failures and withdrawals during during pandemic and we have yet to kind of 
recover a lot of them. And unfortunately, you know, widespread self-reporting of cheating. Right. Just super easy to cheat. Uh, in this I'm sorry, Don, for the next slide, Fred had a his hand up. Please. Fred, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is a great issue. Do you have any data about how different this is in hospitality programs or colony programs versus general? Because, I mean, this is true across all colleges. I didn't know if it was different in our area because of the professional focus, because of the interpersonal skills. You know, you got to be out there in a way in hospitality that you don't have to be if you're studying philosophy. Uh, uh, yeah. Only in a only anecdotal, Fred, and that's why we're going to jump into some research on this subject because I, 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 I think I that's encourage you. worthy. No, I agree. I, 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 say, I say anecdotal because Angie and I serve on boards that kind of cross all disciplines, nothing in terms of, of actual empirical evidence at this point. And quite frankly, it's it, the, the universities are taking a holistic approach, so they're not pursing out particular majors or, or looking at that, but we can talk our boots on the ground with industry knowing knowing our industry partners and then and then our students you know it's prevalent. And, and i think the uni the university should be for all students about mental health issues and helping all faculty it's just i be i support you doing more research on this field because it's even more powerful in the kinds of work we do with students and you call it holistic but it's also you know customer service and self-reflection and okay but i think it might be a good thesis to define holistic under the context of of hospitality tourism you know culinary event management there's a paper donna there's a paper i i hear you loud and clear making my notes duly noted Anne Marie, i hope you're paying attention we're, we're going to need to do some research and just segueing um onto that into that next holistic environment on the next slide jeff can you go to slide six uh is that this one I think yeah. I actually did, it was it some of it was duplicate. I'm sorry, I just realized that. So my habit slide. This one. Six. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize that you were uh, uh, pointing it in. My 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 problem. Sorry. Okay, so again, I talk about habits all the time, right? So we so that pandemic period of time created habits now that we can't undo. You heard me say this, right? So. They're out of the habit of coming to class. They're out of the habit of engaging, um, at, you know, even advising. Um, I can be in my office for for five hours and never see a student. And that was never, you know, that was just never the way. There's just tangible, there's just, just they're just out of the habit of being engaged and on campus and involved. Um, the mantra of meet students where they are should be reciprocal, right? We're working hard to help students, but they also have to come meet us kind of halfway in the classroom, in our labs, where, where they can, where they can do well. And these are, these good habits are education. That, that's what we do. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So, so what are, so what's our job, right? Can we, can we put the toothpaste back in the tube? Can we reestablish um, their ability to learn and what are what's coming into us like from K through 12 that we that we're challenged and so I, I'd say can higher ed re reestablish this culture of education or are you seeing at your colleges and universities um, kind of like a giving in or a acquiescing uh, what are you seeing and please just put a pin in that or feel free to raise your hand right now uh, because you know we're seeing it and you're here for a reason uh, but I'd love to do talk about that in the Q&A. So I'll jump in and just say, how can faculty support students? So if I put that out there, I'm sure you would come up with a number of different responses because you're already doing that. But as we move forward in the presentation, um, we thought we would just kind of focus in on a little bit of what we know. And as Donna and Jeff said, we'll do Q&A at the end. But if there are things that you think we're missing um, as we're talking about this, please jump in. Uh, you don't even have to raise your hand. Feel free to unmute and share. This is meant to be interactive. So we know without question 
there are increasing demands on faculty members. You're probably feeling it. Uh, you may have even reconsidered, do I want to log in this morning at 9 o'clock? I have so much going on. I can't take another hour of something. Uh, we really hope that by you joining us today, you're feeling affirmed and we can give you some ideas and hopefully you can give us some ideas because we all want our students to succeed and we hope for their well-being. So. First, what do we know? We're experts in our content area and in our field. So as Jeff said earlier and as Donna said earlier, we're not trained therapists, but we do have our experience in the classroom. I think your discipline in hospitality management, event management, culinary, uh, as well as mine in communication studies, where we tend to do a lot of interactive and collaborative work, I think our students see us as partners in their academic journey. At least I hope they see us in that light. And as a result, um, and I think, Fred, your question was good. You know, what do we know something different about the hospitality management student um, because of the work that we do? So I think because of our the way that we teach and the way that we reach students, they're more likely to approach us as opposed to an 800 um, student lecture that they may be in for another class. So I think that's important to hold on to. Um, the trust factor is key. I think by you showing up every day, by you bringing your whole self, by showing how dedicated you are to the students, that you have gained their trust um, and that's an important part of sharing. It's important for us to use ourselves as our own barometer. So if we're feeling overworked and unqualified to assist our students with mental health concerns, we really need to take action in our own lives, figuring what can we do, where are our boundaries, and by us establishing that, we're not um, doing a disservice to the student by not helping them across the finish line. In fact, we're doing them a favor by saying, I support you unconditionally, and there's someone on campus who's trained who can help you better to be able to put the pieces together. So making those referrals are so important. Please don't feel defeated. I don't think anybody on this call does, but we do know some of our colleagues are really uncomfortable with this mental health. To my surprise, and this is my own stereotype, uh, faculty members in psychology will say, I'm trained as a developmental or an intercultural psychologist. I don't do mental health. I don't do counseling. Um, and the fact is we can just show up. Fred, go ahead. Um I want to take a little bit of issue with your last bullet. Sure. And, and I think we need to do, we need to look at mental health as a spectrum. And if, if every student came to us with a little difficulty about feelings or about angst or self-concept or whatever, and we put them into therapy, I think we're doing a disservice because we all face challenges and difficulties and frustrations and hard stuff with work there is a way we can be there for them at some part of that spectrum. I, I don't mean clinical depression or whatever, but if we always think only of referral and not working with, you know, emotional quotient stuff, you know what I mean? I mean, yes. that's an important part of, they're not getting along on teams in their assignment. Mm -hmm. We should be there and involved with that issue and not say, oh, you gotta go see a therapist or you're I not agree. coming to class. Let's talk about why you're not coming to class. What what can we do as coaches? Exactly. So I just think we need to be careful how we how we conceptualize that. Certainly, certainly. Um, so what I hope to emphasize, especially in that last bullet point, is the primary support. Um, we've found in the past that some well-intentioned faculty members felt that when students said, you're the only person I trust, they carried the burden with the student. And because the student's okay. like, I'm not ready to share this, um, they were the ones carrying it. And so our message is, work with the resources that you have on your campus to help the student. Don't disappear, but you're not the person that needs yeah. to help them with the primary issue. Now, you also raised another really important point, and that is not every student needs to go to the counseling center. And I know at Widener, Jeff and I are hearing this from our colleagues. Not everybody needs to be referred to CAPS. Sometimes it's an accessibility issue. Sometimes it's just a time management or tutoring issue. Sometimes the faculty member at chat um, and I know in my office, probably as well as yours, you might have a candy bowl or snacks or a Keurig or, or something that just that one on one attention where a little bit of personal care can go a long way. So really learning how to listen, because we don't want to refer everybody to the counseling center, to your point, Fred, I think that's that's 100 percent on point. 
So, but what we can do within our own domains, so we do a lot, but when we think about our classroom, how can we build a supportive environment for learning? And so that's not just the physical classroom space, that's the learning space. First, you all, I know, are building a rapport with your students and that acknowledges their mental health. You might even say to them, you're looking a little tired today or how's everything going? Those statements, um, our students come back and say to us, and I know this isn't true, but some will say, during the pandemic, our communication studies or our hospitality faculty members were the only ones asking us how we were doing. So whether that's true or not, I think it goes a long way and it's appreciated. In this world, you know, we may want to reconceptualize our attendance policies. Uh, so by reconceptualizing, I don't mean just say, take as many absences as you want, but I know my language changed. So it became more about class engagement rather than you're not showing up, you're not, you know, the, the punitive part of it. And I help students look at, there are days that you need to take as absences. And I try to toe the line. I don't make it, I don't differentiate between excused or unexcused. If there's a health issue, come speak to me and then we'll deal with that on an individual basis. But I really am trying to encourage them to be active. So some are great speaking in class, some are terrific posting in discussion boards. Um, some are really wonderful about their assignment. So looking at that and understanding it's not always about the physical showing up, um, it's ways to encourage them to stay on on task with you those due dates um you all know that you're a hero if you extend a due date by one class period you may make a huge difference in the lives of your students also know that when you do that those students who are very literal and they were like i took off of work so i could have you know i could study for this exam so also know it's a two-way uh, street. So um, I just did that this week for students who are struggling with a paper uh, deadline. And I said, I'd much rather have you understand the writing process and revision than I would having you just meet a random deadline. And for that assignment, I could do that. But if you can think about that, that's certainly within your purview. Um, there are ways in which, and we'll show you kind of syllabi examples in just a moment, but your language and your invitation to saying, if you're having difficulty with this assignment, please reach out um, and do that on your terms. So in communication studies, just like in your industry, sometimes we do have to text one another back and forth. And by establishing, I, I, you know, I say to the students, you know, don't text me in the morning and, you know, ask, hey, what am I going to have to do three weeks from now? But if you have something that's more time sensitive, I want you to feel like you can engage with me. It just encourages students when they hit a hurdle, they're more likely to reach out. Um, when you're putting your class information together, your course syllabi, provide the information for campus resources. You'll see a visual in the moment. Of course, the mantra, listen, refer, continue to support. That doesn't mean saying, hey, did you go to therapy? How did it go? What did you talk about? It's just mm -hmm. that link in. How are you doing today? Was it helpful when you had the opportunity to meet? And please know your campus uh, emergency protocols. We had um, an incident on campus where somebody called 911 and that just delayed the response. Even though 911 is natural, what we think about in society, calling campus safety would have had a much, much more timely response to someone. All right, so this is the breathe board that Jeff mentioned earlier. And actually this is, if you look in the top left-hand corner, you can see Dr. Lolly's beautiful face. Um, oh. This is a camp, uh, this is a, a screenshot of his uh, Canvas site. He's using pages to create, to show this is a campus resource. So this is the project my students worked on. And their um, emphasis was promoting mental health resources on Widener's campus. So this actually, this Breathe resource lives within our intranet. So it's on my Widener. Students can go in. You don't even have to be logged in. You type the word Breathe. This visual pops up and you'll see this was older. We'll update this to have the 988 uh, suicide hotline in there, but it shows different resources and how to get in touch with people on campus. It's mobile friendly. So if you need to call campus safety right away and you can't remember what that phone number is, it'll get you to where you need to go. So by having this on campus, Jeff is saying to his students, here are some resources I care. 
the right image is language I use in all of my course syllabi and it basically says mental health and wellness are key factors to your success I'm putting it out there on syllabus day I don't read the syllabus but that is definitely one of the points that I take the time to talk about so you know we know about physical health we want mental health to be front and center so I just want people to know I'm an advocate for their well-being so mental health is health and we all have different issues so this and certainly we'll share these slides with you but this is a valuable resource where you can share this with your students just because it goes along with that mantra you know we're here and we're so happy to be back in person but we all have some struggles from time to time so this is a great resource again it just shows that you're acknowledging it on your syllabus and on the next slide we talk about embrace oh i'm sorry that's the slide after this how to reach out to a struggling student so um, I'm not going to read through this but the do's and don'ts of it you really it's kind of what we've talked about before let students know that you're seeing certain behaviors and that you know that they're a good student and they want to succeed but you're concerned about they look tired they're missing assignments they haven't been coming to class or you're noticing just different behaviors as it relates I think it goes a long way again it's sharing campus resources the I mentioned um, as we were opening this presentation today we had a student who withdrew from the university University. and all in all honesty it really was the right decision but as I was on the phone saying I was trying to save the student a walk across campus to our enrollment services building and they were very kind on the phone they said if you want to put your student on the phone we can do it that way and I gave the student the option and I didn't know she had a friend waiting for her outside of my office door and they walked down together but by making that connection and providing options it allows the student to maintain that sense of dignity that they have that can often feel compromised during moments like this. So they're the things that you can do. Um, if you think somebody's in immediate danger and even if they say, no, I'm okay, use that instinct, make that call and just say, I'm really worried about you and I am doing this out of an abundance of care. Um, it's just that you want them to feel great. This is the seize the awkward. It, it's going to feel really uncomfortable when you say to them, I'm really worried. I'm noticing that. And you might even say that, you know, you, you're dressing differently or, you know, if you're noticing that their hygiene is off or something like that, you may not want to say that with words, but you might want to notice and just say directly, this feels really awkward to me. I can't imagine how you're feeling right now. So I encourage you to take a look at this resource because even if people are somewhat in denial or they're embarrassed, you want to acknowledge their struggle. And then here's the guide to the awkward. So out of an interest for time, I'm just going to look at the major points. Um, we can come back to it if time allows. The I notice that is a non-judgmental thing. Uh, you know, I notice that things we've already talked about before. Your general responses. Um, I also had another conversation yesterday where I did not have the medical knowledge to be able to understand how to have an appropriate reply for what the person was saying to me. So I just did, I'm so glad you shared this with me. I'm so sorry that you're going through this right now. What can I do to help you? Who do you think would be your best advocate on campus? Um, and I, it, I was relying on those general statements to convey care as opposed to an answer. I didn't have the answer. My role was to care and support. For anybody who's hesitant and you get a little bit out of them, acknowledge that thank you so much for sharing this with me. I know that this is difficult. Um, this is so much for you to handle on your own. Let's find a way to make sure your safety and well-being are your, our first priority. Just continue to reinforce. Thank you for trusting me with this. I'm here to support and other people are as well. So I'm gonna turn this over to the growing responsibility for our college faculty. Go ahead, Donna. Which I, I don't think anybody on this call uh, is gonna disagree with the fact that we are doing less, um, we are doing more with less, right? Uh, I think I think we, we did a good job pivoting, uh, but the data unfortunately bears out that we are and you could go to the next slide, Jeff. We are we're uh, beyond stressed. We have there's work. I don't know about your schools, but we're we're seeing um, we're seeing um, a lot of uh, retirements. We're seeing people leave early. Um, you know, just just uh, considering leaving academia and and the constant uh, beating of the drum that we need more support in in a number of ways. So 
um, this was a pretty big survey uh, right post pandemic, but I think we can all look around and know that um, we need more support. And that's one of the things that we're gonna look at particularly is, is the support piece for faculty. This just kind of picks up what Donna uh, has already talked about in terms of we're tired, right? Many faculty <laughs> are mentally and physically exhausted, right? And there are a lot of faculty leaving higher ed. There are, you know, other, um, you know, student health professionals. I had this conversation in a meeting yesterday that are leaving in drones, right? Everybody's running with less faculty, less, you know, uh, administration, et cetera, et cetera. And we're picking up extra work. So we're trying to do the best we can, but we're we're exhausted. And again, you can see the stats. I'm not going to read them, but they're pretty high for the for the comparison between 19 and 20. Again, this is at the height of the pandemic. We don't have any current information at the moment, but I'm I'm sure it's still also very significantly high. Every institutional response is different. Some institutional response have been very supportive. Some maybe not so much. So that's also uh, varies based upon the institution, how big they are, how many resources they have, their budgets, ex budgets, et cetera. And then there are, you can't uh, not look at the disparate uh, impact or effects among individuals, you know, that uh, persons of color, non-binary, disabled faculty, women, et cetera, et cetera, um, that may have, you know, disparate effects on them in this whole situation that we're going through at the moment. I would just add real quick, you know, even just going back to the classroom, it's like it was a little, it felt different. It was a little nerve wracking for me. You know, my the expect I you just didn't go back in and and it wasn't like it wasn't like automatic. It felt different and it is different. Yeah, I mean, last year literally I I really kind of look at it as toss it up to a transition year. That's really what it was, because it didn't feel like going back like every other year has been in the past you know, at the start of the semester. And while this one I think has improved, and for example, the freshmen that we have are at least had their last year in person, it, it's still gonna take some time to move through this whole cycle, right? With students who are online, students are struggling. And, you know, obviously the pandemic brought it out. This is something that's not new in higher ed. It just kind of bubbled up and now- It's an accelerant, that's what right. I call it. The pandemic that's, was just an accelerant. It was kind of the fuel on the fire, yeah, exactly. And and, so, yeah, I would just say, you know, last year we had a rise and grind with Gloria Steele and I and rumor has it that we're getting her back again. So she's an Atlantic care behavioral health specialist and she did a phenomenal presentation for rise and grind and she's going to do it again for us this year. So keep your eye out for that. But one of my takeaways was this little snack model for um, for ourselves. Right. So, you know, sometimes you just need to just shut the computer off for a second and take a deep breath. You know, I had a student for the first time have a full um, panic attack in my class with with students last semester. And that was like enough for me to, you know, I know why I'm so interested in this because I just felt underprepared to kind of help her. Um, and that's a side, but we can talk about that later. But obviously be conscious about what's going on around you about noticing, right? And there, there's, and Angie put it eloquently, I mean, it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just an observance. So accept and acknowledge what's going on in your environment. It just is what it is. Uh, be be curious about, you know, why do I feel anxious or why why do I feel like I need to do this right now? Um, you know, be curious about why you're experiencing what you're feeling every day, because we, we all go in and kind of um, yeah, fight the good fight. And then uh, be kind to yourself, right? Take that time, shut that computer off, take a deep breath, walk the dog. I don't care. Like for me, that's what it is. Like get outside, walk the dog, um, and just do something for yourself. Be kind. And do you want to pick this up? Sure. So the idea of we knew that the folks that are here today were the ones that are trying, probably helping all the students and helping your colleagues as well. So there was... Um, an article that we wanted to share with you. You have the link, Helping Colleagues Navigate Stressful Times. So, you know, make yourself available if you can, but focus on listening over advising. So sometimes our brains are kind of like, what's the right thing to say? How do I say it? And just if acknowledging, I hear you, that sounds really hard. That sometimes, and we all do it, um, we get stuck in that, this is so hard and I can't believe that cycle of complaining. When you know that you're not gonna be able to resolve it, in a gentle but firm way say it was so good to talk about this i know we're not going to find the answers today but i feel better it's a kind of a polite and positive way to say we're done talking about this because we're not going to go anywhere and set the boundaries for yourself so if you say it was you know the 
oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I've enjoyed talking to you today, but I really need to, and whatever that is, I, that's okay, and give yourself permission to be able to acknowledge it in a positive way. You'll feel better about managing your own time, and hopefully they'll feel heard. And then finally, you know, where do we go from here? What's next? And again, over half the faculty in, a, in one particular survey, you know, reported a significant increase in emotional drain and work-related stress. And I'm sure everyone on this call would be part of that percentage. And so really it's how can we support each other? What resources are available? How can we get more faculty involved and engaged? And really, you know, the university, really at the university level, making mental health a top priority, right? Getting key stakeholders. We've done that really well. I think at Widener, there's, you know, we've tapped every area that, because it's yeah. really every area that's impacted by this. And so that's important. We have resource mapping. We've actually done that at Widener, um, which has been very helpful. That's been part of the Breathe Board. I've been a big advocate with Angie, and um, I think this is going to be a priority in this academic year, maybe not in the fall, but in the spring of training faculty and staff. They're asking for it. We're going to have the train the trainer model. I might be one of those train the trainers who can go out and then I can train other faculty in my school and college and so on and so forth. So we have key advocates in all the schools and colleges and academic areas. Um, we do have peer support groups, but even working on that a little bit more, I think, in this coming year. And again, just constant training in a, in a, in a comfortable environment. Um, you know, there are faculty who may be resistant to this and still feel like this is not their responsibility. And so it's that those faculty that, that kind of we need to work with and give them the tools to make them feel comfortable doing this. So that's kind of, I think, what's next and what we're working on. I know Donna is working on as well, and hopefully your universities are as, as well as you we kind of move through this, this challenge in the next year. That's the presentation. We wanted to leave, it's a lot, but we wanted to leave at least five minutes because I know people have a 10 o'clock link, so we want to be respectful of the time, but basically kind of open up for general questions you might have, recommendations, suggestions. Again, I'm very fortunate to work with Don and Andy. They're amazing colleagues. We've done other research. They're both very passionate about this topic. And so again, and it's something that is, is definitely needs to be uh, focused on. And we're looking forward to continue to do this both what we do at our universities. And again, as you mentioned, Fred, it's really right from research in terms of you know, what, what's out there and what we can do. So we'll open the floor to any questions you might have for any one of us, if there are any. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see everybody's wonderful face. There you go. So I have, I'll start off with a question. It's sure, Jen. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I agree with, you know, maybe we need some professional development. Um, and I know at my college, we, you know, we'll have, we have a professional development day um, during like a fall break where, you know, faculty will present something or ideas of, you know, what we could do to help our students. And I think this would be a good opportunity to add this in, but, you know, what does that look like for faculty? Cause, you know, I've had students in my office you know, crying and I'm so depressed and I think I'm depressed and my meds aren't working and, you know, I can't get caught up in class and, you know, I'm hugging her, you know, it'll be fine. How can I help you? I mean, I literally ripped the used pages out of my day timer and gave it to her and said, okay, let's start here. Um, you can have my day timer. Let's get organized. Come to me every day. We'll write down your assignments. I mean, <clears throat> what, when you say professional development, what could that look like? Or do you think, your opinion? Well, I, I think uh, first and foremost, it's training. I mean, we, you know, I think everyone in this call probably understands a lot of what we're saying, but there are faculty out there, I'm sure you can relate to some of your institutions that, again, don't even understand a, a, an ounce of this and still feel it's not their responsibility, right, to just basically say, hey, just to listen. And, you know, what can I, like you just said, Jen, what can I do to help you? And so, I mean, I, I know that's that way at Wider, and I'm sure it's the, that way at other, you know, and it's, it's nothing against any of our colleagues. It's just a fact of reality. So basically, that's what I mean by professional. I mean, it's just really bringing this topic to light, making, making, letting faculty know that there are resources. What can you do? What can't you do? Um, how do you, and I think the biggest thing is seizing the awkward. Really, you know, I'm okay having an awkward conversation, but that's me. I know colleagues in my own school and college, they would not do that. They'll say, well, you should go to the to CAPS, career, you know, and psychological services. 
And, you know, that's not always the case, as Fred pointed out. Sometimes it's very simple. It's just a bad day, right? But so, so I think that's the start and there could be more. And Jen, can I just, I just want to chime in, Jen, because I commend you, right? And, but you're, you're literally like, think about, um, you know, spokes on a, on a wheel, you, you're on a tire, right? You're just dealing with one, you're trying to get her organized and you're dealing with just maybe the academics. When you, if you're going to go back to your colleges and universities and suggest some of these possible intervention methods, which is trying to get stakeholders, Widener has an amazing model. We don't have to reinvent this. But when you sit down and you realize, oh, there's something going on in housing. Oh, there's something going on at home. Oh, there's something going on um, with two of our other teachers. Like you need you need a bigger picture. So you're helping this one lane, you're in this one lane that you're in, but it's so important to get a bigger, to try to get a bigger picture of the student. We have that um, alert form with my student who had the panic attack. The frustration is you send that form back and no one can communicate back with you any of that, you know, I mean, we're not HIPAA and all the other laws and rules, like no one can tell you. So now you're, you know, so, so by having kind of like these stakeholder and, um, you know, you can, you can start to at least see bigger pictures is what I'm saying. So, so kudos, but realize you're just one sliver of the pie. And I would also jump in and say the first, uh, when you're looking at mental health first aid, one of the things that they would emphasize is at what point is it I'm having a bad day? And then when do you cross that line? So helping, having people help you recognize, okay, so somebody's saying I'm really depressed. And then there's a certain point where, you know, I had a student who actually needed to be hospitalized and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we know that suicide and, you know, that vulnerability is just something that we have to respond to right away. But th there are, you know, that training, I think will help you understand this is immediate. This student needs to have immediate action because of a concern. Fred? Fred, you're on mute, Fred. Trying to be deferential to you. Um, the, does Widener have a checklist that a faculty member could have on his or her desk about, you know, is it a, like, is this today's issue? Is this, uh, how long have you been sad? I mean, there's a ton, you know, there's like about 12 questions that would be, would be from uh, my <clears throat> notion is that if we disseminate the 12 questions to a ton of faculty, it all of a sudden clarifies a ton of this stuff. And at question eight, that needs a referral. But you know, if it's about the assignments like Jennifer's doing, or they need some encouragement, they need an attaboy, they need a virtual hug, or they need a reassurance, you know, and there's we've all been through college, we both into graduate school, we know that we needed that too. But there, but it the remote has added other stuff, pandemic added other stuff, but if they there was a list of the questions. It might help a lot of faculty members feel less scared about asking some of the questions or playing snack. No, I, I agree. And we have a decision tree, not necessarily a checklist that, that's been developed. I, I think that would even be better and, and something, Angie, we could talk about as we move forward on the read board. The problem, Fred, is that I don't know that a lot of faculty, unless you're invested in this, like myself, even know about that. And that's where the, the you know, sharing of information, the training, I think, has to happen for all faculty so they're aware of what can I do? What, what are the steps? And then you're right, breaking it down to something as simple as a 10 point question to know what to do next. I know we're kind of one minute out and a lot of us have deans and directors at 10 o'clock and other things. So I want to thank everybody today. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, this will be this is recorded. Maureen's going to put it up on the Nina website along with the slides and we have access to any of the resources and would love to collaborate with anybody in the future that wants to do so. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the speakers and this is very helpful and the next week uh, next month we're going to have I don't know maybe it's a nice coincidence we're going to have a sort of a continuation topic on this line where we'll talk we have speaker coming to talk about mindfulness teaching and research. All right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Go thank yelling, you. go. Yeah, I'll send out the uh, information maybe uh, this afternoon or, or early next week. Thank you so much and have a nice weekend. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Stay safe. You too.